Hari Hari. So we will explore four critical lessons from the viewpoint, from the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita. In this presentation, we'll focus on the first of those four. There are four Purusharthas. Purusha means human being. Artha means way, purpose, even, or aims, goals. So the four Purusharthas translates into the four ways or the four paths for the human being to achieve success in life. The first is dharma, the foundations of a successful life. Think of the game of chess. The first thing that has to be known is what is chess? What is a chess board? How do the various pieces interact with one or the other? How do they move? How do they affect one or the other? How the pieces, how the game is to be played? This is dharma. In other words, it's understanding the reality in which we exist this material physical world, this material physical body, and, and, which is essential, our spiritual nature as well. Our spiritual nature, our spiritual identity is as much, indeed, even more important than our material reality. Both realities have to be taken into consideration. So dharma, is understanding all of the pieces of the puzzle, all of the pieces of the chessboard, and how they interact with one another. So our physical reality, our spiritual reality, and of course, the supreme reality, all of these realities exist simultaneously, and we are part and parcel in these realities. So dharma is understanding all of these realities, their interactions, how they affect one or the other. What is this reality we are existing in? Understanding that is the very foundation. It's the first part of beginning to develop and create a successful life for ourselves. The fourth, sorry, the second Purusharta is Artha, the means of achieving a successful life. So going back to the example of a chess board and the game of chess, Artha would be learning how to play, learning how to play the game, developing the skills to become a master at chess. So artha are developing the skills. Now that we know what this physical reality is, how it interacts with our spiritual nature, how it interacts with the supreme being and how the supreme being is involved, knowing all of that, artha is, okay, now how do I live? How do I exist in the midst of all of these realities. This is Artha.
The third Purusharth is Kama. A lot of times it's described as sense enjoyment, and that is an accurate description of Kama in this regard, or it's an accurate description of the word Kama to enjoy one's senses. But in the context of the Purusharthas, it means a bit more as well. If our senses are unhealthy, how can we possibly enjoy? If our mind is unhealthy, how can we possibly enjoy? So calm is not merely the act of enjoying our senses. It's making sure we have a physical and material body so that we can use our mind and senses in this world in a successful, uplifting, positive way. So it's not merely sense gratification for the sake of sense gratification. It is about developing the means, body, mind, intelligence, to be able to journey through this life without being beset by so many various disturbances, issues, mental, physical, and so on. The game of chess, using that example, it would be being able to play, being in an environment where you can actually play the game. If you have seen a chess tournament, they're silent, well lit, there is both players are comfortable, and they're focused on the game of chess. This is comma. This is having our situation, our environment, the world in which we live, the body in which we live, the place, the home, so on and so forth, the family environment, everything about our environment is conducive for our playing the game of chess. This is comma. Moksha, the goal of a successful life. The goal of playing chess is to capture the king, to win the game and to capture the king. Now, this is a caveat. It should be, when you're playing a game with relatives, with friends, it's not about winning, it's about bonding. I learned this very early in life, in school, uh, Every couple of weeks in math class, instead of our mathematics assignments, the instructor gave us, we all had to play chess. And besides the fact that it oftentimes ended up being World War III <laughs> and relationships were frayed, we were quickly taught that, yes, we're trying to learn, we're trying to win, but it's also about having bonding relationships. So that's an aside. That's not to um, distract from the presentation we're having today. I'm using the example of chess to describe the purush, uh, purusharthas in a manner that we understand how to fulfill them. So the goal of chess is to win, is to capture the king, and once you've captured the king, you have won. The goal of a successful life is freedom from samsara, freedom from the erishadvargas, defeating the erishadvargas. Moksha, there are two types. Jivan Mukti and Videha Mukti. Jivan Mukti means in this life, in this body, in our present situation, we are free from the conditioning of Prakriti. We are free from Kam, Krod, Lobha, Moha, Madha, Matsarya. They do not have any control over our consciousness. This is Jivan Mukti, essentially. The second type of moksha is Videha Mukti. Videha Mukti means after we have quit this body, when we have died, there are no more 
karmic conditionings that will force us into another material body. We are essentially karma free. So we're no longer forced to take on another material body. This is the goal of chess. To gain control, mastery, to defeat the Arishadvargas. This is a statement by Narad Muni to Dhruva Maharaj. Dhruva Maharaj was a young boy. He was insulted by his stepmother and his father did not come to his aid, did not come to his defense. So he was a young boy. He went to his own mother. His mother said, I cannot help you. You need to go to Vishnu. And the young boy, Dhruva Maharaj, said, where is Vishnu? And his mother, Suniti, says, the great sages and saints, they go to the forest and focus on their sadhana to see Vishnu, the Supreme. So Nar uh, Dhruva Maharaj left home. On his way, he encountered Narad Muni, or rather, Narad Muni, the all-knowing Narad Muni, realizing what was going on, appeared on the scene when Dhruva Maharaj was headed out to the forest. Dhruva Maharaj shared his predicament, his frustration, his upset, his anger, and Dhruva Maharaj says, I want a kingdom greater than my grandfather. Dhruva Maharaj's grandfather was Manu. Dhruva Maharaj's father was Uttanapad. King Uttanapad's father was Manu. So Dhruva Maharaj says, I want a kingdom greater than my grandfather. Or he may have said great-grandfather. And Dhruva Maharaj's great-grandfather is Lord Brahma. Whatever the case may be, I believe it was great-grandfather. Be that as it may. Narad Muni says, first Narad Muni tried to dissuade him. He says, you're a young boy, go back home, play, don't worry about this, don't be so upset by a few words. Dhruva Maharaj was adamant. No, I want a kingdom greater than my grandfather. So Narad Muni says, very well. If that's the case, Dharmartha Kama Mokshakim Ya Itchit Shreya Atmanaha Ekam Yeva Haris Tatra Karanam Pada Sevanam. Any person who desires the fruits of the four principles of religiosity, economic development, sense gratification, and at the end, liberation, should engage himself in the devotional service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Hari. For worship of his lotus feet yields the fulfillment of all these. Just an aside, the English translations of religiosity, economic development, sense gratification, and liberation are accurate but incomplete as we've just learned English often translates poorly from Sanskrit be that as it may Narad Muni is telling Dhruva Maharaj if you want to fulfill Dharma, Artha, Kama and Moksha Narad Muni did not leave out Moksha if you want to fulfill all four of these, Hari Pada Sevana. Hari Pada Sevana. These are ten shlokas from the Bhagavad Gita that give us a basic understanding of dharma, artha, kama, and moksha. If you learn 
these 10 verses of the Bhagavad Gita, you will know the Bhagavad Gita. So I highly suggest memorizing all 10 of these verses. They will help you throughout your life. Memorize both Sanskrit and English of all these verses. Let's begin this presentation. We're focusing on Dharma. Shreyan Svadharma Viguna Paradharam Atsvanishtithat Svadharam Enidhanam Shreya Paradharam Obhayavaha This is from Bhagavad Gita chapter 3 text 35. In parentheses I've put chapter 18 text 47. And the reason why is because this verse is repeated by Krishna in chapter 18 text 47. The first two lines of this verse are identical to the first two lines of chapter 18, text 47. Only lines 3 and 4 are slightly different. So in the beginning of Bhagavad Gita, early on in chapter 3, Krishna recites this verse. At the end of the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 18, there are 18 chapters in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna repeats the same verse. So whether we're at the beginning of our spiritual journey or towards the end of our spiritual journey, this verse, this principle applies. The principle of Svadharma. It is essential, Svadharma. In the 18th chapter, early in the 18th chapter, Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Yagya dhana tapa karma nityajyam karyam evatat. Acts of sacrifice, charity, penance should not be given up. They must be performed. Krishna says, indeed, sacrifice, charity, and penance purify even great souls. Pavanani Manishinam It is similar with our Svadharma. Our Svadharma is never to be given up. No matter where we are on our spiritual journey. Why? It is far better to discharge one's prescribed duties, Svadharma, even though faultily, than another's duties perfectly. Destruction in the course of performing one's own duty is better than engaging in another's duties. For to follow another's path, to follow another's svadharma, is dangerous. Krishna repeats the exact same instruction in chapter 18, text 47. Krishna says, you follow your svadharma. If you engage in your svadharma, you will purify yourself of karmic reactions. Let's explore. There are two categories of dharma. The first category is naimitika, 
Naimitika means temporary. Naimitika means it's based on the material body. When the material body dies, the dharmas that are connected to the material body are also now null and void. The dharma connected to the material bodies obviously are no longer valid once the body has died. So these types of dharmas are called naimitika, temporary. Prakriti, kala, and karma. These categories of understanding of knowledge, which are talked about in the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita talks about five subject matters. Prakriti, kala, karma, and two more. So prakriti, material nature, kala, time, karma, activities, these are all within the realm of naimitika dharma. They're all on the naimitika level. Prakriti is temporary, kala is temporary, and karma, activities, are temporary. So all activities that happen in the sphere involving those three things are all naimitika. And those practices include svadharma, sadharana dharma, varnashram dharma, and yuga dharma. Svadharma means the inclination which is part of who we are the deepest core quality nature inclination proclivity of our being that's what dharma and the activities that spring from that the impetus that springs from our svadharma siddharana dharma means universal dharma universal for human beings there are four Tapa, Shocha, Daya, and Satyam. Tapa means self-mastery. Have a measure of self-control if we want to live in a civilized society. Shocha means cleanliness. Be clean in our environment. Also clean in our mind in terms of our motivations. Purifying our motivations. If we want to live a successful life, we must be clean in both environment, body, and in mind. Daya, compassion. We must be compassionate to ourselves and to others if we want to live a successful life in a civilized society. Satyam, truthful. We must be truthful and honest with ourselves and with others around us if we want to live successfully and in a civilized society. So that is Siddharana Dharma. Varnashram Dharma. Varnashram, the four varnas and the four ashramas. The four varnas, most of us will know, Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaisha, Shudra. The four ashrams, uh, Brahmachari, Grihastha, Vana, Prastha, and Sanyas. We will not talk about the four ashrams today. We will talk about the four varnas. And then there is the Yuga Dharma. Yuga Dharma means the activities of the current age, the current era. This is Kali Yuga. So in Kali Yuga, there is a prescribed method for achieving moksha. All of these dharmas are naimitika. They are based on prakriti, kala, and karma in some forms or in some interaction of these three. Either material body, civilization we live in, the time, the era, all based on prakriti, kala, karma. So these dharmas are naimitika, temporary. Then there is Sanatan Dharma. As I mentioned, there are five subject matters Krishna covers in the Bhagavad Gita. Prakriti, Kala, Karma. Those are Naimitika and temporary. And the other two are Ishwara and Jiva. Ishwara and Jiva are spiritual. They are eternal. So these are the five subject matters taught in Bhagavad Gita by Krishna. Ishwara, Jiva, Prakriti, Kala, and Karma. 
On the side of sanatan dharma, those activities which are eternal, that means after the body dies, the soul still manifests or lives in this particular type of dharma. This is called jaiva dharma. Jaiva means jiva, the dharma of the soul. The dharma of the soul is a tato brahma jignasa. A tato brahma jignasa means now is inquiry into brahman. So the quality of the soul is brahma bhuta. The soul is brahman. Ishwara, Krishna is brahman. Ishwara and Jiva are qualitatively one. Qualitatively. So activities that facilitate the oneness, the qualitative oneness of the Ishwara and the Jiva, those are activities of Sanatan Dharma. When the soul is connected to the Supreme, when the spark is reunited with the fire, that is sanatan, that is jaivid dharma, that is the nature, the quality of the soul to be reunited with the Supreme, with Brahman. So there is naimitika dharmas, the dharmas pertaining to time, place and circumstances, our material reality, our material body. Then there is sanatan dharma, the dharma or the nature, the quality of the soul of the jiva, which is Brahman. And how do we facilitate, manifest that as well? Both dharmas, Naimitika and Sanatana or Jaiva, must be facilitated. Now you have a full and clear understanding of dharma. Now, as we dive into a deeper understanding of dharma, there is some background information or foundational information we must know. Karma. For every action, for every action is an equal and opposite reaction, right? That's what Newton tells us. That's not karma. Karma means for every act, there's a consequence. Whether it's equal or opposite is irrelevant. There is a consequence. What is karma? Karma is the petrol, um, the diesel that spins the cycle, the wheel of samsara. The energy that spins that wheel of samsara is karma. The wheel of samsara is taking one birth after the other, one birth after the other, one birth after the other. Going around this wheel requires energy. That energy is karma, activities. When we engage in an activity, when we water the plant, I'm sitting here in the mandir in Northborough, I'm observing the banana trees we have in the temple. I water the banana trees, that is an act. Consequences are inevitable, both for me and for the banana tree. If I cut down the banana tree, there is a karmic consequence, both for me and for the banana tree. The banana tree, that living entity and I are now bound together in this dance of karma. So because when I watered the banana tree, I did something that was beneficial. The banana tree now owes me something in return. There has to be a consequence of my benevolent act. So that living entity owes me a debt of gratitude. Now that living entity, the banana tree, has to take birth in order to repay the debt of my generosity. 
let's say I cut down the banana tree. Besides the fact that the temple managers are going to give me what for, <laughs> that living entity is now bound to me in another karmic dance of action and consequence. So the banana tree, that living entity now has to take birth in order to repay and have me experience the act of being cut down. So now the banana tree has to take birth again, as well as I. It doesn't matter whether the action was benevolent or not. A karmic bond was created and it has to be experienced. It has to be repaid, whether it was beneficial or not, whether it was positive or negative. And as you see, we have to take birth, both myself and the banana tree, in different bodies to experience the consequences. We take birth into another body, and now we're spinning the wheel of samsara. So karma is the diesel that spins this wheel of reincarnation. Some people then say, some philosophies then say, stop acting. If you stop acting, then you do not create karma. You do not create these karmic interactions that then have to be repaid or expended. Krishna, completely, the Vedas do not recommend inaction or the lack of action to become karma-free. In fact, Krishna spends several chapters of the Bhagavad Gita literally saying precisely this. He was saying action and inaction is very hard to understand. He says, no one knows what action is, what proper action is, and what inaction is. I'm not going to go down that. That's another presentation for another video. The point I'm trying to make is what is karma? Karma is the diesel that powers samsara. It keeps it going. Round and around and around we go. But the purpose of karma, this is essential to understand, is to bring us to the level, to the point, where we can do what? Atato Brahma Jignasa. Brings us to the point where we can inquire into the Supreme. The banana tree cannot make that inquiry. The banana tree, even though it is jiva, even though it is also a qualitative identity with the Supreme, it cannot inquire into the Supreme from the body of a banana tree. It must come to the human species. And this is what makes the human species unique. This is why it's called the Purusharthas. Purusha means human beings. The human beings can engage in Dharma, Artha, Kama, and Moksha. Dharma, Artha, Kama, and Moksha have no sway, are not even applicable to the animal species. The animal species, birds, bees, plants, they are completely governed by Prakriti. It is only in the human species where we're given enough freedom of choice where we can do otherwise. In chapter 3, text 35, the verse for this presentation, Krishna says, do not engage in an other svadharma. Engage in your own svadharma. Do not follow another's path. Only a human being can do this. Animals, can a cow cannot be anything other than a cow. It cannot be a tiger. A banana tree cannot be anything other 
than a banana tree. It cannot be a bird. It is only in the human species where we are given enough leeway, where we have the freedom to choose one dharma over another. And you all know why I talk about repeatedly, if you've been following me for the past 20 years, you know how choice is essential because without choice, there cannot be love. That's why we have choice. We have to have the ability to choose something other than. Because if we have the capacity, the ability, and the freedom to choose something else, then we can also choose love, bhakti. So let's get back to the issue at hand. The purpose of karma is to gradually elevate the living entity, the jiva, to the human species. When the jiva, when we, when we have come to the human species, we can then ask, atato brahma jignasa, what is brahman? And there begins our journey towards moksha. Varna. We talked about Varnashram Dharma. Years past, I would give lectures at various <clears throat> Hare Krishna temples, if you know the Hare Krishna movement. I would give various lectures and seminars on this topic and similar topics and on Varnashram. At the beginning of the presentation, I would do this exercise. I will do it here. If you're not familiar with the four varnas of Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaisha, and Shudra, don't worry. Um, but if you are, then this particular exercise will resonate with you. So the Brahmanas are the so-called priestly class. The Kshatriyas are the administrators, the warrior class. I like the term administrators better. Leaders of society. The Vaishas are the, one would say the mercantile business leaders of society. And the Shudras are essentially everyone else. Oftentimes, Shudras are giving a very, very bad rap. Described as being low class, low born, lazy, so on and so forth. So I would go to various Hare Krishna temples and I would do the following. I would say, I would list the qualities of a kshatriya, just the qualities. And then I would ask the assembled Vaishnavas, the participants, based on these qualifications, what varna have I described? And the, all the hands would go, oh, you described a kshatriya. And I would do this. So I would list these qualifications. Now, these qualifications are given by Narad Muni in the Bhagavad Purana. So they're there for everyone to see. I would list all the qualifications for a Vaisha. Cow protection, economic activity, business, so on and so forth. Just the qualifications, I would ask what Varna hands would shoot up. Oh, it's a Vaisha, it's a Vaisha, it's a Vaisha. Then I'd list the next set of qualifications. Truthful, gives in charity, clean, honest, so on. What Vada have I described? Oh, it's a Brahmana, it's a Brahmana, it's a Brahmana. All hands. Wrong. Those qualities, or the qualities given by Narad Muni of a Shudra. Granted, I removed from that list of qualities given by Narad Muni one giveaway quality, which Narad Muni says, the Shudras serve 
the other Varnas, the other three Varnas. So I took that out of the list, but the rest of the list, all the qualifications of the Shudra are identical with the qualifications of a Brahmana. I kid you not. So if all the qualifications of a Shudra are identical with all the qualifications of a Brahmana, except for that one, which is serving the other Varnas, is that the defining, differentiating quality between the two? That's a very, very small way to identify or differentiate between a Brahmana and a Shudra. They're opposite ends of the spectrum. Why are they at opposite ends of the spectrum? If the qualities of a Shudra are identical to the qualities of a Brahmana, you would think they would be close cousins, but they're on the opposite ends of the spectrum. What makes the Brahmana Varna on the opposite end of the spectrum of a Shudra? This is a very, very essential and important point about Varnashram that 99% of people, well, I shouldn't it's unfortunate. Most people don't, <laughs> haven't been taught about Varnashram as I've been taught. So it's, it's understandable. But it's a misconception that is causing so much problem, so much anxiety, so much misunderstanding, so much confusion when people try to talk about their Svadharma. Because people don't want to think, they want, oh, I'm a Brahmana, oh, I'm a this, I'm a that. Absolute pishtosh. So let's clarify this. Think of a dot. That dot is a shudra. That dot is the concern of a shudra. That shudra's concern encompasses only him or herself, no one else. You take a Vaisha and you put a circle around that dot. That circle is the concern of a Vaisha. They're not just concerned with their individual selves. A Vaisha is concerned with the well-being of them, their family, their extended family, their community, perhaps their town or you know, their social group. Kshatriyas is a larger circle. It includes Vaishyas, it includes Shudras. The Kshatriyas are concerned with the well-being of the nation, the well-being of the world, if it's an emperor, right, in Vedic times. The Brahman, that circle is even greater because what is the definition of a Brahman? One who has realized Brahman. That's a Brahmana. All the qualifications, yes, are all there, but a Brahmana, by definition, is someone, an individual who has realized Brahman, whose consciousness is merged with the consciousness of the Supreme. The consciousness, the spark, has been reunited with the fire. That is a Brahmana. In that state, Brahma Bhuta Prasanatma Nasochati Nakankshati Sama Sarveshu Bhute Shumad Bhaktim Labate Param. On the stage of Brahma Bhuta, Surida Sarva Bhuteshu, all living creatures, all, everyone, worldwide, all species of life, all living entities, are in the circle of concern of a Brahmana. This is why Brahmins do these, we read all of the stories of great sacrifices done by the Brahmins, sponsored by the Kshatri kings. They do all of these sac sacrifices to uplift not just human society, but the consciousness of all creatures. This is what differentiates a Brahmana from a Shudra. This is why a Brahmana 
even though all of the qualities are identical with that of a shudra, the difference is responsibility. That is the key word to take away when understanding varna, responsibility. Shudras do not want responsibility for anyone other than themselves and perhaps their immediate family. Shudras are highly qualified individuals. In fact, if the world, many of you have heard, have heard me say this before, if the world were run by Shudras, this would be heaven on earth. But a Shudra would never take up the responsibility to rule the world because they don't want the response. It is not within their nature to even seek the responsibility of anyone other than themselves and their immediate family members. That's a Shudra. There is nothing wrong with that. Quite the opposite. That is to be lauded. We need more Shudras, in fact. The problem is we don't even have Shudras in Kali Yuga anymore. Worse than Shudras. No honesty, no integrity, no charity, no generosity. These are qualities attributed to Shudras. Real, real Shudras. It's about responsibility. Now, to identify our varna, that's all we have to do. Look at our inclination towards responsibility. That is the most important step, not the only, but it is the most important step in understanding our varna. If you are inclined only to take care of yourself and your immediate family members, you are a shudra. It does not mean you are low class, low this, low that. It simply means that you take care, you do not want to be responsible for others. Now, we have to define responsibility according to Vedic teachings, right? Responsibility has all kinds of connotations, but it's very, very clear what responsibility means in Vedic teachings. The definition was given most clearly by Rishabh Dev. Guru nasasyat, svajanau nasasyat, pitha nasasyat, janani nasasyat, daivam natatsya napatish chasasyan, namucha yadya samupetya mrityum. This is how he describes responsibility. One who cannot deliver his dependence from the path of repeated birth and death should never become a spiritual master, a father, a husband, a mother, or a worshipable demigod. Worship of Badim God means a leader in society, right? A celebrity. A celebrity is our version of a worshipable demigod. Or well, that's how we can take it. The responsibility to deliver one's subordinates or dependents from samsara. That is the definition of responsibility in Varnashram. Shudras do not want the responsibility of delivering the world from samsara. Vaishas will take up that responsibility. And this responsibility looks very, very clear to understand. I'll put it that way. We talked about Naimitika Dharma and Sanatana Dharma. So a practical understanding of responsibility in relation to Varnashram means 
all of those for whom you are responsible, you will facilitate their fulfillment of dharma, artha, kama, and moksha. That's what responsibility means. For my family, I will ensure that my husband, wife, children, <clears throat> immediate family members, I will facilitate whatever it takes for them to fulfill dharma, artha, kama, and moksha. The Vaisha will do whatever they can for their community. For all the people in their community to fulfill Dharma, Artha, Kama, and Moksha. The Kshatriya does this for the entire state. Brahmana is interested in all living entities fulfilling their Dharma, Artha, Kama, and Moksha. Now, of course, those Purusharthas do not apply to the living entity, but Dharma does. A tiger has dharma. It has no choice, but it has dharma. So, responsibility means ensuring that all those individuals under our responsibility, or for whom we are responsible, they can fulfill their dharma. For human beings, it's dharma, artha, kama, moksha. For all other living entities, that's dharma. That means we should not interrupt the dharma of another living entity. The definition of an asura is someone who hinders another living entity from fulfilling dharma, ahartha, kama, and moksha. That is a demon. That is an asura. If we try to impede another entity from fulfilling dharma, artha, kama, and moksha, we are asura. That is a very basic understanding and definition of an asura. We find this in the Bhagavad Gita when Krishna describes divine and demoniac natures. So going back to varnas, the shudra can be the professor in the university. Just because someone's an academic doesn't mean they're a brahmana. You can have a 200 IQ individual teaching in the university, highly qualified in that regard, and they can be a shudra because their only interest is in their personal sphere of research, what happens with that research, they do not care whether or not an atomic bomb is built with their research. They do not care what is going to be the findings they come up with. As long as they can do their research, they can do, they can get published. They are fulfilled in their life and they want to take care of their family. There is nothing that is laudable, but they're not a Brahmana. They are a Shudra. So it is not about the work per se that determines whether one is a Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudra. The differentiating factor is do you want to be responsible for the dharma, artha, kama, and moksha of your dependents? As Rishabha Dev said, namucha yadya samupetya mrityum. If you cannot deliver them, so it's dharma, artha, kama, and moksha. If you cannot deliver your dependents, do not become a leader. Remain a shudra and take care of your immediate family member. At least yourself, if you're not married, but your immediate family members. Make sure they are on the path. 
make sure they are able to fulfill dharma, artha, kama, and moksha. The purpose of varna. The purpose of varna is to bring our consciousness to the level where we can once again atato brahma jignasa. That's the purpose of varna. Whether it's for ourselves or whether we do it for the greater community, for society, or for all living creatures in the entire world, the reason why we should remain situated and fully functional in our varna is so that we can engage in jaiva dharma. We can fulfill dharma artha kama moksha. And in that way, progress on the path towards Brahman realization. Now, Svadharma. What is the purpose of Svadharma? Yes, you guessed it. Atato Brahma Jinyasa. The purpose of Svadharma is to bring us to the space, to the level, where we can inquire into Brahman, but also achieve Brahma Bhuta. The purpose of Svadharma is to expend karma. I'll say it again to emphasize. The purpose of Svadharma is to expend karma. Let's go back to the banana tree. I have done something beneficial. I watered the banana tree. Or I've done something detrimental to the banana I cut it down. Whatever the case may be. Now myself and the banana tree have karmic points, if you will. We'll call it karmic points for the time being. That must be expended. In order for me to expend the karma I have accrued from either watering or cutting down the banana tree, I've accrued a certain number of karma points, let's say five points. In order to expend those karmic points, I have to assume a particular type of body. Let's say I have to become a banana tree so that I can be watered by the banana tree I watered before. When that happens, then the karma points are expended. Now, this is fine in the animal species. The problem, and this is where Krishna says, and this is why the verse, chapter 3, text 35, and chapter 18, text 47, come into play. Krishna says, for the human being, discharge your svadharma. Do not engage in another person's or another's path. That's dangerous. Why? Let's give you an example. Let's say I was, because of my past karma, I was born into this world with, let's say, 100 units of karma. I've been giving the perfect body, the perfect mind, the perfect set of senses to expend 100 units of karma in this life. Those units are tied to my svadharma. So by engaging in my svadharma, I expend those hundred units of karma so that when I leave this body, at least those hundred units are gone. I may have a thousand units, so I have to take up another body to expend the other 900, be that as it may. But in this life, I came in to expend 100 units of karma. My svadharma which is, remember, Swadharma is our core drive, inclination, proclivity. That does not change. That is part of who we are, part of the body that we have. Not who we are, the soul is who we are, but part of the body of what we, we uh, inhabit. That body has a specific core Swadharma, which is given so that we can expend the karma we have come to expend in this life. 
But now there's a problem. Because I am a human being, I can abuse my freedom to choose. And rather than engaging in my own swadharma, I engage in another's swadharma or another dharma that is not my own. So because I have strayed from my path, my swadharma, that hundred units of karma that I have are not going to be expended. I will retain those 100 units of karma. So when I die, the 100 units of karma I came in this world to expend, I still have, which means I have to take an additional body and I have to do it again just to deal with those 100 units of karma. Not only that, not only do I still retain the original 100 units of karma, but because I'm over here on a different path, engaging all kinds of activities, I am accumulating additional units of karma on a completely different path. So now I leave this life, not only with the original 100 units of karma that I came into this life with, but also with the additional 200 units of karma I have created by engaging in another's path. So I leave this life with 250 units of karma. That's why Krishna says, do not engage in another's path, for to follow another's path is dangerous. Krishna says this twice. At the beginning of Arjuna's journey in learning, understanding the Bhagavad Gita, and at the end of Arjuna's journey in understanding the Bhagavad Gita. Identifying our Svadharma. A lot of people come to me, and not come to me, but email me and ask questions And over the years. How do I, how do I, how do I find my Svadharma? Oftentimes, the reply is, do what you love. Find what you love and do what you love, and that's your swadharma. And what your swadharma is going to come easy, those things that you're, you can do very easily. No. And oftentimes, it's hard for me to have to say this and tell people this, that the fact of the matter is, your swadharma is not necessarily something that's going to come easy to you. Remember, Krishna says in this verse, your swadharma can appear to be the cause of your destruction. Krishna says it's better to find destruction following your path, your swadharma, than to take on another's path and find apparent success. So just because we're using the term Svadharma doesn't mean it's going to be a rosy, easy, glorious path. Your Svadharma is not about what's easy. Svadharma is about expending karma so that you can be reunited with Brahman. To expend karma. That's the purpose of Svadharma. Not to, for you to have an easy life. That's not the purpose of Svadharma. <laughs> this is often where I lose people. <laughs> but I, it, it, it cannot be, I will not, it, there's no softening this. If you're looking for an easy way out of difficulty in life, this is not it. The Bhagavad Gita is not it. Vedic spirituality is not it. Vedic spirituality, the Bhagavad Gita, is about expending karma so that we can achieve Brahma Bhuta. The spark can be reunited with Brahman, with fire, with the Supreme. Our consciousness is pure. So identifying Swadharma, the way you identify Swadharma is not by finding, look, what do you like? 
what do you enjoy doing? It's actually just the opposite. What do you not like to do? What turns you off? What activity? What music? What individual? What type of person? What actually causes you to come to the point of disliking and hating something? Causes you the greatest distress. Not only what, but also why. What type of job do you absolutely would not go into attempting? And then why? Once you've answered the what and the why on many different levels, what you'll find is the opposite of that was your swadharma. What do you, what kind of person do you not like to associate with? That you cannot stand being around and why? Then you will find the type of person with whom you should hang out with. What type of job or industry would you absolutely refuse to enter if it was the last industry on the face of the planet? You would rather go hungry than enter that industry. And why? Understand that, you will know what occupation suits your Swadharma? That's how you identify your Swadharma. Another visual I want to give you is think of a diamond. A diamond is a diamond, pure. How are they determine the purity of a diamond? I think it's carrots, right? 24 carrots is a pure diamond, whatever it may be. You are a pure diamond. Your swadharma is a pure diamond. But diamonds have facets. And as the diamond turns, the light catches a different facet at a time. One facet at a time. And that facet shines bright. As the diamond continues to turn, that facet goes, I wouldn't say goes dark, but no longer reflects the light. And a different facet reflects the light and shines. This is our Swadharma. This is who we are. Our Swadharma is a diamond. It's not, it doesn't, it's not like half of it's bell metal, half of it's copper, half of it's diamond. No, our Swadharma is our core, unchanging nature connected to the material body. I want to be clear on that, not the soul, to the material body. It is our core, essential, material nature. However, as we go through life, right, the turning diamond, as we go through life, we take on various different roles. We're a child, we grow up, we go to school, we become a parent, we go to this job. We take on numerous different roles. This is the turning diamond. And based on the roles, then a particular facet will shine. Our essential core, the diamond doesn't change. But sometimes a facet of our swadharma is emphasized over another. That can happen. That will happen. Because we come into this world with the purpose of expanding all different types of karma. We're bringing all kinds of baggage from previous lives which we're trying to expend, which we should be trying to expend. So as we go through this life, life flows. We go through different roles, different situations, we grow, we mature, and so on and so forth. That's the turning diamond. Various facets will be emphasized. Various parts of our being will shine more than others at different points, different times, different situations in our life. The question is, we have to know this. And this is where we come to the third point, staying true to your Svadharma, being true to your core being the diamond, rather than being distracted by these various facets that are emphasized based on the various roles or situations you may experience in life. In order to remain true to your svadharma requires daily sadhana. And this is where we get it wrong and thus go through life so confused. Remember 
Life is not static. Life is dynamic. The diamond is turning constantly. And life will put, will shine on various facets of who you are at different times, at different points, and in different situations in your life. In order for you to know this, you have to have a sadhana. A sadhana meaning a daily sadhana where you are engaged in svadhyaya. You're engaged in self-understanding, self-awareness, self-realization. This is a daily practice. Otherwise, you will go through life. Now, remember, Swadharma is not about an easy life, but a Swadharma will give you a life that is not confused. That's the difference. Not easy, but also not confused. There will be no confusion when you're following your path. That's what Krishna tells to Arjuna all throughout the Gita. He always throws this phrase, without a doubt, do not be doubtful. Are you free from doubt? It's all about doubt, not ease. We confuse with Dharma with it should be easy. No, not easy. It will be free. You will be free from doubt. You will not have confusion. That was the first question Krishna asks Arjuna. Why are you confused? How has this confusion come upon you? You should not be confused. Arjuna was not a stranger to hardship for crying out loud he just came from a forest for 13 years. Hardship is not Arjuna's issue. Even killing the people on the battlefield is really they're all his enemies. They chose to be there. He didn't drag them there. He did everything he could to avoid the battle beforehand. Making hard decisions, experiencing hardship is not Arjuna's issue. Arjuna's doubt is coming from not being connected and understanding his Svadharma and how his Svadharma is to lead towards ultimate Brahma Bhuta. The purpose of Swadharma is to cleanse our karma so that we can atato brahma jignasa, we can inquire into the supreme and achieve brahma bhuta. That's where Arjuna got lost. He forgot the purpose of the chess game. Shrayan Swadharma Viguna Paradhara Matsvanushtitat Swadharma Nidhanam Shreya Paradharamo Bhayavaha. It is far better to discharge one's prescribed duties even though faultily than another's duties perfectly. Destruction, destruction in the course of performing one's own duty is better than engaging in another's duties. For to follow another's path is dangerous. I recommend you go read the verse 1847. It is identical. Better to be destroyed, I'm using air quotes, by following your Swadharma than succeeding, I'm using air quotes, in following another path. Because we've come to this world with this specific body, specific psychophysical makeup, to expend specific type of karma. Follow your Swadharma. Know your Swadharma. Stay connected to your Swadharma because it will appear to change as we go through this dynamic life. It will appear to change. It doesn't. Your Swadharma does not change. But various roles, situations, circumstances in life will require various facets of your Swadharma to be emphasized, absolutely. In order to be aware of this, you must have a daily sadhana of self-development.
धर्मार्थ खम मोक्षाख्यम या इच्छिच श्रेय आत्मन एकम हेव हरस्त कारणम पाद सेवनम any person who desires the fruits of the four principles dharma artha kama and moksha should engage himself in the devotional service of the supreme personality of godhead hari for worship of his lotus feet yields the fulfillment of all these In the comment section, you will see the link to the test for this presentation. I suggest you listen to this presentation again, take your time, take notes, and then go and take the exam. Hari Hari.